good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. Welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. So today we are going to talk about human memory from the perspective of our design principles for intelligent systems. And as we will see, I think there are a lot of interesting uh, insights that we can gain by doing so. So today's schedule is as follows. First, uh, we will have, uh, I, I have some preliminary comments and then we will talk about memory. And then we have two highlights today, a guest lecture by Professor Vera Zabotkina from Moscow in Russia, and then a guest lecture from uh, Professor Jose del Millan from EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland. Here are the sites that I will be contacting today. And here is just a preview of uh, our guest speakers, uh, today's guest speakers for lecture eight that we will get back to <clears throat> in just a second. So topics, some preliminary comments. So uh, I came across this uh, website, which I mean, this is a, a system that has been around for a while uh, it was announced in Wired magazine uh, 2009, and the idea is, you know, we're all, all scientists one way or other. Now the question is, of course, talking about artificial intelligence, will we as scientists still be useful in the future, or will our tasks be taken over by computers or by robots in the future? Now, this is basically... Uh, hot, this is Hod Lipson at Cornell University, you know, a really crazy artificial intelligence researcher and robotics engineer, and he developed this uh, uh, program called the Robot Scientist. And basically, it's a website, you can download a program, and then you can just feed, if you have data, anything. It can be financial data, it can be, you know, astronomy, it can be climate data, what have you and you just feed the stuff into this program and it will come back with the equations that best describe the data. <laughs> and it's absolutely amazing what this program comes up with. Now, my uh, uh, sort of intention would be to find a volunteer in the Global Virtual Lecture Hall that will give a short presentation next week, you know, five to seven minute uh, presentation about this uh, robot scientist. You can uh, send me mail uh, afterwards if you're interested in this. I think it's a fascinating idea, and maybe you can you know, briefly report what it is and then you know, an evaluation of it from your perspective, you know, critical or uh, what, pros and cons or whatever. Okay, now uh, we, I would like to start with the discussing human memory from the perspective of our design principles. If we look at human memory, there are substantial differences to computer memory. Now, maybe we can briefly talk about some of them. Uh, maybe we can uh, have some uh, comment from... Uh, Korea from Seoul, from SKKU, on some of the differences between human memory and computer memory. Maybe we can switch to uh, Seoul. <clears throat> I think we can say good Hello. evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, so I think we have to be careful here about the frame of reference problem. You know, on the one hand, of course, we have performance performance measures, which are behavioral measures, you know, interaction with the real world, and on the other, we have the underlying mechanisms, right? So I think we have to, we have to be uh, careful about that. Okay, so uh, can you give us perhaps some idea on the differences between uh, computer and human memory? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. We think human memory and computer memory are both very complex uh, storage devices. Although computer memory is much faster at processing information, the, hu the human brain is, in fact, larger in storage capacity. And computer memory grows by adding computer chips. Memories in brain grow by stronger semantic connections. 
It's much easier and faster to for the brain to learn new things. Yet the computer can do many complex tasks, uh, complex tasks at the same time that are difficult for the brain. It's easier to fix a computer, just to get new parts, but there is no new or used parts for the brain. And brain is always ch changing and being <laughs> being modifi uh, modified. Even when an animal is sleeping, its brain is still active and working. The computer only changes when new hardware or software is added or something is sealed in the memory. And the computer is faster at doing logic things and computations. However, the brain is better at inter uh, interpreting the outside world and uh, coming up with new ideas. Also, the brain is capable of imagination, but, but the computer can't. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it was so fast that I couldn't really you know, <laughs> uh, uh, write down uh, all the ideas that uh, you were presenting. So, well, thank you very much. I think you mentioned some, some important points. Uh, now, what you were talking about is basically, you know, the human brain versus uh, a, a computer, uh, what, and, and some of the comments that you made were specifically about memory. So uh, maybe we can have some, uh, so I mean, some of the things are about memory, you know, memory in a computer is fast, you know, it's got a, a large capacity, but human memory also has a large capacity, but maybe nowadays the capacity of computer memories are, you know, much bigger than the capacity of human memory. Now the idea of interpretation, of course, and, and you see here, it's not clear how to separate memory from other aspects. You know, that's, I think that's uh, an idea that we have been discussing many times. You want to isolate a particular component, but you always have to consider the complete organism. And I think in the comments that you made uh, from Korea, uh, we can see that you know, this distinction is really blurred. You know, what is really memory? Now, what I would like to do is maybe switch to uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. Can we switch to Abu Dhabi? Maybe you can give us some more ideas on differences. Maybe now specifically focus on a memory, a memory rather than the brain in general. Of course, the brain is what makes up the memory, but maybe you can specifically give us some differences concerning memory. Do we have anyone there in uh, Abu Dhabi or maybe not? Huh? Okay, I don't think anyone is present there, so maybe we can, uh, we can uh, switch back here. So let me just, uh, uh, or maybe I can ask the question to the local audience here in Zurich, uh, what some of the differences are specifically about memory, you know, memory performance, memory mechanisms. <clears throat> Do we have any volunteers? If you sort of think about how our memory functions, I mean, you're all, you all use computers, you program computers, yes. So there is a, a statement there, Jen? Okay, let's get the microphone and maybe we can get the camera. Can we get the camera? Yeah. Okay. Go so um, in humans, memory is almost always connected to any kind of um, experience. So it might be that you um, that you remember touching something that might be connected to to haptics, or it might be um, connected uh, uh, might be related. I I meant to. Um, to any other sense, like um, feeling something, um, seeing something, hearing something, um, and I thought you gave you gave an example in a book where you, where you said um, if you experience a similar situation again, then um, the memory comes up again. Yes. So. Um, Right. In essence, this it would be um, a notion of embodied memory, you could say. Right, right. So I think that's, 
extremely important. So in, in human memory, things are always connected to experiences. So it's very hard to isolate one thing, and that's, I guess, one of the purposes of human memories, to be connected, to be networked, to senses, to recognition of similar uh, situations. Okay, thank you. So I think that's, uh, it's interesting to think about that just to get into the spirit of uh, actual uh, memory, <clears throat> memory research. We will, of course, now discuss in more detail what this is all about. Now, one of, one of the striking phenomena, if you look at the research, memory research, <clears throat> is that there are many, many different, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are many different concepts of memory around. And let's just look at a few of them. I just listed a few of them. This is by no means all of them. I mean, the obvious one uh, is that we're all familiar with is uh, the, you know, short-term memory, which is sometimes also called primary memory versus long-term memory. You know, short-term memory or working memory with a limited capacity. Remember, you know, the limited capacity of short-term memory, which was, you know, remember the magical number seven plus or minus two, where we introduced this notion, or George Miller, who introduced this notion of chunks, because it's hard to measure memory capacity in terms of bits and bytes as we're used to. So we introduced the notion of chunks. And then we have a very important distinction, which is the one between episodic and uh, semantic memory. It's very often used, and I think it's a very fundamental distinction. And maybe uh, we can briefly switch to uh, Chiba. Uh, Oh, they have, uh, they have a connection problem, so maybe we can uh, switch to uh, Osaka then. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> for a brief explanation of the differences between Osaka, okay, between what we mean by semantic memory and uh, episodic memory. Would you venture a uh, characterization of these types of memory? Can you hear us at all? Okay, maybe someone else, uh, someone else can uh, take over here. Maybe Karlsruhe. How about Karlsruhe? I think this is a good one for Karlsruhe. Yeah, semantic versus uh, episodic memory. Um, maybe semantic memory would be to uh, ma making an association between two concepts actually related logically. Um, and episodic would just be um, because of one's own experiences, you associate, I don't know. Uh, That's episodic. Example, the That's then the episodic memory for, based on, on your own experiences. That will be the episodic memory. I mean, the, the concepts, the relations, I think, you know, this, this basically the, the facts, you know, semantic memory would also be about facts. Now, the episodic memory would be more about... Yeah, what... The episodic memory will be more about what? What types of... Uh, what, what will be the characteristics there? I mean, it's like episodes, you know, th things that you experience. It's more like related to the experience, to the actual experience. And, of course, the two are related. You know, you take something like, let's say, at the uh, semantic level, something like the Shanghai Lectures. If you take the Shanghai lectures here, then maybe the first time you came into the auditorium for the Shanghai lectures, you remember the specific event, right? When you went there, you went in there, and there was this guy standing in front, and you know, all these other sites connected. And then over time, <clears throat> basically, this 
individual, oops, oops, sorry, I, I, I should have written this on this side. That's the episodic memory side here. I should have written this f first time, you know, you experience that. You walk in the door, you see the guy, you see the other students, you see the other sides connected, and then over time, you do that many times, and now we've, we've been here like eight, nine, ten times, then this turns into something like a concept, right? So the Shanghai Lectures as a concept that you can talk about without the need to remember a specific uh, episode. So the two uh, types of memory are actually very closely connected. <clears throat> now there are more concepts. There is propositional memory, you know, which is about uh, facts, statements about the, about the, uh, typically about the real world, which is related to semantic memory. So I think these two are closely related. And then we have many memories related to the sensory modalities, you know, like visual memory. We have sensory buffers, for example, in visual, in vision, vision, the visual memory at the periphery records vision for a very short period of time, for a fraction of a second, and then it's gone. But it is a kind of memory, just has a very short time characteristic. Then we have acoustic memory, of course. Acoustic memory, an interesting one is flashbulb memory. So probably most of you remember the 9-11 disaster in New York. And most people, you know, because this is an emotionally charged event, most people tend to remember very precisely what they were doing exactly at that time. Right? So I, I say, well, I was in a bar, you know, it was shown on television, and I was zipping, you know, a drink, so and so and so. So most people can remember very precisely. Now, it turns out that flashbulb memory, people report that they can remember very precisely. But there are actually many studies demonstrating that this is all, you know, just made up afterwards. <clears throat> and, you know, for example, people said, I was at this particular hotel in this and this city, and then the researchers went back to the, to the books of the hotel, you know, the registration, and they found that they had never been there in, in this uh, particular hotel. So it seems that people have a tendency to make up these memories as well. It seems like a compulsion that we, is, is very hard to escape. Autobiographical memories, anything that relates to our own history. There's olfactory memory, of course, for, for smells, uh, uh, tastes. Declarative is, again, very closely related to propositional memory, and so on. And then and I think a very interesting distinction is the one between explicit and implicit memory. So this memory, once you start thinking about it, has all these very strange properties. So explicit memory is what you can explicitly remember, you know, what is the, the uh, capital of uh, Switzerland, or, you know, just facts about the world, who is the, the president of the United States. That's explicit memory. You can explicitly refer to it. Now, a lot of, and we've had that before, a lot of what we memorize and what determines what we do and our decision-making is implicit. We're not specifically aware of it, but still, it's what determines what's happening, right? So I think it's scary on the one hand, but it's also a very interesting phenomenon. There is also conscious, unconscious memories, and so on and so forth. Now, yeah. There is a question. Chen, can you pass the microphone there? Yeah. So we have a question from the audience here. So my question is, how is, can you go back one slide? Yeah. Yeah. How is the distinction between explicit and implicit memory different from conscious and unconscious? Because the way you described it, it seemed to me that they seem to be um, um, mutually the same. Uh, I think they're very closely related. Uh, I mean, many of these, there is a lot of overlap between these concepts. Now, 
But as, as, as far as I can tell, it's maybe a different community, you know, doing research. Some of them will more talk about conscious and unconscious, you know, especially in the clinical, clinical community, you know, in, in uh, I think, psychoanalytic thinking, conscious and unconscious would be the terms that you use. And in more cognitive academic psychology, you would move, more use the terms explicit and implicit. But there is a definite relation between the two. But I think maybe the more neutral ones are explicit and implicit, because there here you would sort of need to sort of endorse some kind of, let's say, psychodynamic theory or something to talk about conscious and unconscious, whereas the explicit and implicit is sort of a more neutral term. But I think uh, th there is a lot of overlap in, in the two, and I've, I, I'm not sure I could actually point out exactly where the differences are, but it's a good point, yeah. And it holds, what you're saying holds actually for many of these concepts here. And depending also on the kind of literature that you read, people will tend to use other terms. Anyhow, it shows, I think, this, this large variety of terms that people have created for memory shows the complexity of the phenomenon, right? What we're really up against. And maybe it shows also that, you know, it, it's, it's good to have an embodied perspective on things. Okay, now let's look at the, the classical notion of memory which is uh, memories are stored in a particular location from where they're later retrieved. I mean, that's how we conceive of memory. That's how computers function. You know, that's what we're used to. And in psychology, uh, Alan Badley, you know, the, the sort of champion of memory research, written probably the textbook on human memory, a system for storing and retrieving information. You know, it sounds very innocuous, very simple and straightforward. So what's the problem? And its problem, that's the next slide, and its problems. Uh, so many people have been criticizing this. I just mentioned a few here. There is a, a really big debate. So if you look at this, the first one, Bill Clancy, uh, from, uh, originally from Stanford University, now working for NASA, he criticized this notion of memory as stored structure. So we tend to think as, of memory as something, you know, we store it, something, a structure that we store something, and we later retrieve it. You know, Bern is the capital of Switzerland. We later retrieve this structure. <clears throat> Let's look at that for a second. What you see here is a fountain. And you see that the water in this fountain has a particular shape, you know, kind of this bell shape. Okay, so a very clear structure is visible here, okay? Now the question is, what is actually the underlying mechanism here that brings about this structure? Or uh, stated differently, the question, where is the structure you know, this spell shape, where is it stored? Right? Where is this structure stored? So maybe we can briefly switch to uh, Shanghai. Good evening, Shanghai. <clears throat> Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, we can very well. Um, I think if, stru if structure is stored in the ladder of the photon, um, because the ladder position and the deep angle determine the direction of the auto motion and, and uh, its diameter determine the speed. Um, so we can get some information of the photon, the previous motion state by observing its nozzle and predict the auto motion according to the change of the um, not hold. Uh, so I think um, its structure is stored in the level. Thank you. Okay. So the so there is no sort of specific memory where this shape is actually stored, but it's in the jets. The angle. I, you could also say you know the pressure at which the the water uh, comes out. And then I think what's really important is that we have gravity. 
So it's basically gravity, and then you, it's immediately clear that the shape, the shape of the water is the result of the interaction of all of these components. So basically you have the jets, you have the pressure comes out, as you were saying, at a particular angle, and then you have gravity acting on it. And so basically the resulting structure is created on the fly, so to speak, as the water emerges from the jets through the interaction with the environment, right? I think that's a fundamental issue that we need to understand. And now, if we have this metaphor of the fountain in mind, all of a sudden, you know, when we talk about memory, maybe we're going to be thinking differently about what memory is really about, whether it is really about stored structures or not. I think we really have to be uh, careful there. So thank you, Shanghai, for your uh, thoughts on this. Another problem, another issue here is, you know, take a song that's recorded, someone's singing, and then you hear the song again played by piano. So what you're actually hearing is very different from the actual song. Now, if it were just storage, of the previous song, and now the piano, then you couldn't recognize the song, but you very easily recognize it. So it has to be more than just uh, mere storage. Or take a stored mental image. What's a stored mental image? So that's uh, uh, Rosenfield, uh, who has been uh, publishing this provocative book, book with the provocative title, uh, The Construction of Memory. Oh, no, no, it's called the invention of memory. So basically, the invention of memory. Uh, he said, well, if you have a stored image, let's say a stored image of a friend, well, which image of the friend? In what position? You know, was he sitting, standing from the back, from the front? What clothes was he wearing? And so on and so forth. Which image? So if you talk about stored images, you know, you're really in trouble with this. An interesting one is also Bartlett, a famous psychologist, who in 1932, he has this uh, book called uh, Remembering, and he said, well, look at tennis. So in tennis, no two strokes will ever be alike. So a stroke is created every time according to the needs of the situation. And so you can't really say that, you know, these are stored programs that are then just replayed because each stroke is different. If it were a stored program, it would be the same, right? So we have to take the interaction with the environment into account. Then let me just, I think I'm running uh, behind schedule. Let me just skip this uh, homunculus problem. You, can th you remember that, fundamental problems. You know, you think someone is in inspecting the memory. Who is it who is actually inspecting the memory? You know, is that you? Well, what is you? You know, is it a homunculus? So we, we always run in trouble if we uh, evoke this, this idea of memory as stored structures. And the storehouse metaphor, which is you know, it's also called the storehouse metaphor, you store something, you retrieve it, that entails all the problems of classical artificial intelligence with symbol grounding, you know, frame problem, and so on and so forth. What I would like to discuss now, and I think that's really of fundamental importance that's a new notion of memory. It's very fundamental. It goes back to the famous cybernetician Ross Ashby, who wrote these two books uh, that I can really recommend. They're very, very old, 50 years old, uh, 30 years old, I don't know exactly. That design, one is called Design for a Brain, and the other, An Introduction to Cybernetics. And he has an, a new, uh, he proposed a new conception of memory that I find extremely compelling. And this is just a cartoon. Keep this cartoon in mind. So uh, as, you, as we're uh, reading Ashby's idea. So let me just, I think it's so important that I'm just going to read this text to you. So uh, you will have it uh, in the slides. So he says, suppose I'm in a friend's house, and as a car goes past outside, his dog rushes to a corner of the room and cringes. To me, the behavior is causeless and inexplicable. 
So we have an inexplicable behavior. Then my friend says, he was run over by a car six months ago. The behavior is now accounted for by reference to an event of six months ago. If we say that the dog shows memory, see the wording, it's interesting. See, he says, he says uh, if we say that the dog shows memory, we refer to much the same fact that his behavior can be explained not by reference to his state now, but to what his state was six months ago. Months ago. If one is not careful, one says that the dog has memory and then thinks of the dog as having something as he might have a patch of black hair. One may then be tempted to start looking for the thing and one may discover that this thing has some very curious properties that we just uh, you know, looked at a second ago. Clearly, memory is not an objective something that a system either does or does not possess. It is a concept that the observer invokes to fill in the gap caused when part of the system is unobservable. So it's the unobservability of part of the system that forces us to invoke the theoretical notion of memory. Now, if we knew everything about the state of the dog, you know, the brain states and everything, then there would be no need to refer to something in the past because everything is contained in the current state of the dog. We only refer to the past because part of the system, actually most of the system, is really unobservable. So it's the observability that's the criterion, and memory is not something that exists, but it's a notion, a theoretical notion, that we invoke to bridge the gap between the past and the current, and you know, we have something, we can't really explain it on the basis of what we observe, so we refer to what has happened in the past. You know, I say, for example, a student performs well at an examination, and then I can say, well, that's because he or she has been studying in the meantime. <clears throat> so I'm trying to give an explanation of the current behavior by reference to events that have happened in the past. I think it's an extremely important uh, notion that we need to, to keep in mind. And there is always a frame of reference problem lurking somewhere when you talk about memory. <clears throat> if you take a classical memory experiment, you have a learning phase, then you have... So basically, learning phase would be... We're presenting a list here is the, the Wexler memory scale test, a famous memory test. So you, you have a list, you present a list of words to a person, and the person has to learn this list. Okay, just try to memorize the list. That's the classical, typical experiment. And then you have some intermediate task, and that's to prevent people from rehearsing. So a typical task here would be counting backwards from 100, 100 in steps of seven. So you have to say 193, 86, you know, 79, and if you have to do that, you can't possibly think of something else while you're doing that. That's the purpose of the task. <clears throat> and then, then there is the test phase, which either is recall, when you tell people just try to remember as many of the items on the list as possible, or it could be recognition, so you show them another list here, a recognition list. You show them, for example, this list, and then you say which of the items were present on the original list, and then you would find, well, it's going to be, uh, I guess, traffic and, uh, and target. Okay, now, I think what, what many people do is they say, ah, because I have these lists, and basically, I mean, this is, we just write this as a list, and then this we write as a list again. Now I have a list here, I have a list here. I assume that the storage mechanism in between is also in the form of a list. That would be the stored structure. I think that's not, that's a complete misunderstanding of the frame of reference problem. We can say nothing about the mechanism uh, uh, just, uh, just from this. Bill Clancy had actually a good metaphor. He said, this would be like modeling a camera's mechanism by describing the photographs it produces. 
I think it's a very, uh, it's a very cool uh, way of, of stating this uh, mechanism. Okay, this is just a recommendation to look at, uh, at Ashby's ideas. Okay, now, <clears throat> some additional notions uh, of memory, embodied notions of memory, I think more and more people realize that memory is not just some abstract entity you know, sitting somewhere, but it's always part of a complete organism. And I think one of the first to really make, in psychology, to really make that explicit was Arthur Glenberg, who wrote this famous article called What Memory is For. He said, well, memory has not evolved to remember lists of words, but memory is part of an organism that helps the organism survive in and act, perceive in the real world. That's what memory is for. Corey Adam Goldsmith has said, the growing interest in embodiment phenomena brings action to the forefront of cognitive phenomena. I mean, for us, from an embodied perspective, this is next to trivial. And we remember from, for example, optic flow, remember, as you move, as you interact with the environment, you generate patterns of sensory stimulation, which are the raw material for a cognition for the brain to process. So the interaction with the environment is crucial for memory. And that's counterintuitive, you know, when you think about it. But we'll, we'll say more about that in just a second. Here on, on this list, in the, in the, if you look at the classical memory experiments, at the classical memory experiments, you are trying to precisely control the environmental conditions and then sort of established a pure memory function. You know, if you have list and then as output a list or what you describe, we should say, you don't have a list. You have something that you describe as a list. And at the output, you have something that you describe as a list. And then you infer that the mechanism would also be in the form of a list, which of course is complete nonsense. Interesting, I think, is the ecological approach to memory. So there is a lot of research on memory in the real world. Now, the reason people prefer the laboratory is because you have more controlled conditions. In the real world, it's much harder to control the uh, conditions. But there is interesting research on eyewitness testimony, which is, of course, highly relevant in court. You know, who wins the court case? And so uh, Eleanor uh, Roche is probably one of the most famous memory researchers, and she did experiments on testimony. So one experiment she did, she showed people videos of traffic accidents. And then she would ask a question like, how fast was the car when it drove over the stop sign? And then at a later point in time, they would test the memory of the subjects for presence or absence of a stop sign. In fact, there was no stop sign present in the video, but those subjects that were asked how fast was the car driving as it went over the stop sign mostly reported that there was, in fact, a stop sign in the visual scene, even though it was not there. So the specific interaction when the memory was evoked, I mean, now notion of memory, was modified by the way in which the question was asked. I mean, it's an old thing. People know that this is the case, but we have to be aware of the fact it's not something stored, but we interact with the environment, and each interaction with the environment also modifies the, the memories, and we cannot distinguish between what has been modified and not modified. Okay? So we have to be clear that our memories are, you know, it's very fragile. They're very fragile sorts of, sorts of things. So it's very sensitive to context, also to motivation. What I really want is what I want to see. That enormously modifies our memories. What I would like, uh, what what I would like to have happened in the past. So we do that all the time. So more and more, we're beginning to see that the storehouse metaphor, you know, storing something somewhere, is not really plausible. Also, I think frame of reference, we have to be aware, let me just have a quote here from a famous uh, cognitive, cognitive psychology uh, researcher. 
We have to, you know, this, this is about the frame of reference. Clearly something in the system must have changed, must change as a result of experience, but the changes may be diffuse and widespread modifications of the whole cognitive system so that the system now interacts with aspects of the environment in a different way, rather than events being recorded specifically and discreetly like events on a video recorder. Again, you know, arguing against this uh, storehouse metaphor. Now, I would like to go back to something that we looked at uh, when we talked about neural networks, and that's stack, this distributed adaptive uh, control architecture. And I would like to switch to, uh, what, where we, did we already have Osaka University? Maybe we can, uh, we can switch to Berlin then. Can we switch to Berlin? And we have this DAC uh, architecture. Now, where is the memory of the DAC robot? It was kind of a, yeah. OK, someone from Berlin. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I think in the uh, connections of the neural network controlling the robot. Right. It's the connections, definitely the, uh, the connections, yeah. So it's basically these, these, uh, the, the, weights, the weights here of the neural network, the connections, yes. So the memory, basically the change in behavior is due to a change in the strengths of the, uh, let's say, neural connections here. Now what's also important is that only makes sense if it's embedded in a particular physical system. Okay? If you take this network, you embed it in another physical system, that other system will not be able to do anything useful with that. Right? So it's in the connection strengths, but only if this network is embedded in a particular physical system. I think we, sh we really need to keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's look at some of the, the uh, design principles. Complete agent sensory motor coordination and the situated nature of memory. <clears throat> so, if you, for example, you know, you hear a snatch of a song, you know, just a little piece of a song, and then you can't really remember, you now it goes, but then you start maybe humming yourself, and through the humming yourself, all of a sudden, you know, it goes on. So basically, through your own physical production of this song, you are, let's say, creating the memory of the song. It's not pure reconstruction. I think you're actually creating, uh, creating the song. Or another example is my co-author on this book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, Josh Bongard. Uh, we, we once we went together to the main train station in Zurich and there was a ramp and so he, we were walking down this ramp and then he said, oh, by the way, that reminds me that as a child, when, we, when I had to go to the dentist, we were walking down exactly a ramp like that. So the walking movement itself can be seen as part of the memory you know, that sort of reminded him, had we not walked down that ramp, he wouldn't have thought of the, you know, having to go to the dentist as a child. So I think the, the, the actions themselves constitute an important part of our memories. <clears throat> now, the last part I already mentioned, memory as, uh, memory as recategorization so every interaction with the environment changes our memory. So I see a person that I know, I see the person again. My memory has changed instantaneously. There is nothing I can do about this. So this memory will be changed forever. And so every interaction with the environment changes our memory. Now, so what's a memory? So I think memory as recategorization is a very good metaphor as uh, described by Edelman. We should really keep that in mind. <clears throat> now, this, there is this notion of scaffolding, and scaffolding means that we're offloading part of our cognitive load to the environment. There is a nice, uh, a beautiful book by uh, 
uh, Andy, Andy Clark, I think it's called uh, Natural Born Cyborgs, and he says, our brains make the world smart so that we can be dumb in peace. Or to look at it another way, it is the human brain plus this chunk of external scaffolding that finally constitutes the smart, rational inference engine that we call the mind. So, I mean, that's interesting. So he says, well, the mind is not sitting in here, but it's basically the interaction. We offload a lot, and then it's, it's in this interaction. <clears throat> also, the, uh, in, in the memory experiments, it's typically the case, and you, you realize you know that, everybody knows that, recognition is much easier than recall. You know, recall is just trying to memorize. Now, try to take a, take a, you know, a friend and now try to memorize what the friend exactly looks like. And then, you know, maybe try to draw it. It's very hard to do. Whereas, if you see the face, you see immediately, ha, you know, it's a friend. So recognition is much easier than uh, recall. And so what you're doing is you're basically offloading a lot of this task to the interaction with the environment because you know if you encounter the person in the real world you will know so you don't need to store that right so you can offload this task a lot of this information to the interaction with the environment and remember Rodney Brooks's famous quote the world is its own best model you know so why should we model the world if it's if it's there in the, in the first place, okay? Right, now maybe we can switch, is Xi'an connected? Maybe we can briefly switch to Xi'an. Hello, good evening. Can you give us a couple of examples of scaffolding? Do you have some examples of scaffolding of how you can offload some of the cognitive tasks to the interaction with the environment? Uh, we can't hear you. Can you switch? Uh, maybe, maybe you need to switch on the microphone. I worked before, okay. Maybe you need to switch on the microphone. Ah, hmm. oh, we can't hear you. <clears throat> okay, so why don't we why don't we take another side? So why don't we uh, switch to? Um, well, who would like to volunteer here an example of scaffolding? I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Oh, so we have here in Zurich. Yes, okay. Go ahead. Can we have Hello? the camera? Can you hear me? Um, as an example, we could take the signs on the road. Ah, absolutely. Road signs, and then basically all I need to do is follow the road signs, and I don't need to know anything about geography, right? Okay, other examples? Can we have some more examples, maybe from the global lecture hall? We to-do list, so I don't need to remember stuff. I just write it down and look at it later. Right, exactly. It's, it's very obvious, yes, very good point. Taking notes, you know, maintaining an electronic calendar, GPS, you know, now you, there's no need to know anything about geography. Uh, whatsoever. <clears throat> now, what are the, some of the design principles that are actually involved? Maybe uh, Karlsruhe, what are some of the design principles that are actually involved in scaffolding? What do you think? There's some design for, you know, we had all of, of the whole set of about eight design principles. What do you think could be applied to this notion of scaffolding? You could call it maybe cheap design? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Can you sort of elaborate a bit? But I think it's, it's, it's a perfect, uh, it, it fits perfectly with scaffolding, yes. If you take the GPS example, why should I uh, waste my time remembering all the codes? Exactly. Exactly. So basically, I'm just exploiting what's already there, and then I don't have to worry about it. So I think it's a very nice uh, example of uh, uh, applying the principle of Jeep design here. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, let's uh, continue here. Thank you uh, to Karlsruhe. Let's continue here, and let's take the example of the passive dynamic walker. Maybe not done. Can you briefly play the video of the passive dynamic walker? Okay, now here you remember, we've all seen that before, the passive dynamic walker. And we also asked, oh yeah, we see, we see this uh, notion of self-stabilization. You remember that you know, it's the lower left corner here. We have the mechanical system, the task environment, this notion of self-stabilization. And we asked the provocative question, uh, <clears throat> where is the memory for walking. So maybe someone uh, in the uh, global lecture hall can volunteer, uh, can volunteer, uh, maybe, uh, how about, uh, is Budapest uh, connected? Yeah, okay, hi. Oh, we can't hear you. Would you? Ah, okay. okay, now we can hear you, okay. So where is the memory for walking here in the passive dynamic walker? Uh, the memory is actually created by the tuning of springs and the creation of uh, the actual body of the walker itself. Exactly, exactly. So there's no specific location in a computer memory or anything because there is no computer memory. <clears throat> And so it's in the morphologies, in the distribution, weight distribution, in the frictional so, uh, characteristics of the system, and so on. Which gives us a, a new notion of uh, memory. Now in uh, Denis, well, let me skip this. I think uh, there's one last topic now uh, on memory that I find very interesting that I would like to briefly mention to conclude my comments today. <clears throat> There is a famous uh, paper by a neuroscientist, Walter Friedman, in 1991. And what he did is he recorded EEGs from the olfactory bulb, that is the smell organ, you know, the, the brain area that is responsible for the smell organ in uh, rabbits. Now, what he did is basically he trained the rabbits to recognize sawdust. And then he recorded the EEGs and he gets a particular pattern. Then he trained the rabbits to recognize the smell of banana. And he recorded the EEGs and he would get this as the recorded EEG patterns. The details don't matter. And then he again presented the sawdust to the, to the rabbits, and they could clearly, you know, from the behavior, he could infer that they recognized the sawdust, and then they would record the EEGs. Now, interestingly, if you compare the, this thing on the right here with this thing on the left, what can you say? They are completely different, even though they recognize exactly the same smell. So, I mean, talking about the storehouse metaphor, at least at the level at which the EEG tells us something about the brain state, this smell of sawdust is not recorded or stored at that level, right? Otherwise, the two would not be so different. I mean, there's really, there's virtually no relation between these two EEGs, <clears throat> which I think is very interesting, even though it's exactly the same smell. And this is only the smell organ. This is not the whole brain. This is only the olfactory bulb. But even there, I think you, you are hard pressed to maintain the notion of memory as stored structure. I mean, the story is a bit more 
uh, complicated. Um, right, I mean, this, this was basically also a shock because it said, well, you know, if you record brain states like EEGs, then, you know, people had hoped that they would be able to say something about the memory by looking at the EEGs. Now, now he's thinking about this and this and this. If you look at this, well, there's no way in which you can do that. Okay, so I think the story is more complicated than this. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, let me just summarize. I think, yeah, let me just summarize what I've said. So we have, you know, talked about two notions of memory, the storehouse me uh, metaphor, and we said, well, it's maybe not the, because it just doesn't describe the phenomena properly, so a more embodied notion of memory. Memory as part of a complete organism that has to act and survive in the real world, react, perceive, and so on, is much more appropriate. And then this, I think, is really, this is something you really have to remember, and that's memory as a theoretical construct. Memory is not something that exists. We always tend to think of memory some, as something that exists, but it's more if you think about it, it's more about the relation between the observer and the observed individual because it's the how much can I observe. If I can observe everything, if I have the robot puppy or if I have the deck architecture, I don't need to refer to anything like memory because I know the entire state of the system. Okay. But if not, then if I and that's a relation between me and the individual. If not, then I have to invoke the notion of memory. Especially in brain science, people say, well, the memory is in the synaptic strengths, you know, just as in our neural networks. Yes, that's definitely true. That's the mechanism, right? Then we say, well, this idea of, of memory is implemented in the brain as modification of synaptic strength. Then I'm talking about the mechanism. That's a different story. Okay, of course it's related, but it's a different story. Right, and then we have seen the strong uh, dependence of memory on the interaction with the world. So it's not something that's just here and it's stored somewhere and I retrieve it. It always depends on the interaction with the real world. There is no way out of this. There's absolutely no way out of this. Memory as an aspect uh, of, of the complete agent, so the complete agent principle, and memory as in Freeman as a dynamical system where you cannot just you know, look at the state and then say, well, that's what people are thinking about. <clears throat> yeah, again, you know, this interaction with the real world, behavior, not a stored structure. I think this is also behavior not a stored structure, but emerges as agent interacts with the real world. And also, always remember the fountain. You know, where is the memory for the shape of the water in the fountain? It's produced in the interaction. The structure is produced. And the parameters, the mechanisms, are at a completely different level. You know, it's angles, it's pressure, it's openings, you know, those are different categories, and then you get the shape. So why should you assume when you observe a particular structure, as in memory structures, that the, under, the underlying mechanism is all, has also that, that shape? In the water fountain, it's, it's definitely clear. It's completely, completely different. Also here, where is the memory for something? I mean, brain scientists, especially in the imaging domain, they go through a lot of effort trying to figure out where episodic memory is located. Maybe that's the wrong question. You know, thinking about Josh Bongard and the dentist, you know, when he was walking down the ramp at Zurich main station. It's maybe part of the complete agent. Right, and yeah, okay, let me, let me just uh, leave the last point. You can, you can read about that. So again, you know, we have very short time here in the global lecture hall, so you need to do a lot of reading. So read chapter 10. Try to figure out Simon Bove's uh, crazy experiment on delayed 
reward learning without memory. You know, it's a provocative title. Try to figure it out. It's a tricky experiment. I think it's very interesting because the robot there learns something, but it offloads a lot of the tasks to the interaction with the environment. And then we uploaded an interesting article um, on uh, here, this one, called Does Intelligence Require a Body, which was just recently published in Science and Society the, in, in the EMBO journal, the European Molecular Biology Organization journal. And why am I mentioning this here? Now, brain scientists have often been relatively resistant to the notion of embodiment. Now it's beginning to change. And molecular biologists, you know, mostly brain researchers, they are now sort of beginning to get interested in notions of embodiment. And I was particularly happy to see that, you know, I mean, the molecular biologists, they're really hardliners in, in brain science. But even they have to recognize that um, uh, intelligence does require a body. So I can, we uploaded it uh, to the website. So I would highly recommend that you actually uh, go through that. <clears throat> And then to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall, thank you for participating today, and see you all next week. Nathan?